Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. After what feels like our longest break in quite a while, uh, no World Tour racing in the past week since the Giro, but here we are for Cretum de Dauphiné 2022 Stage 1 recap. For the Tour, there's three preparation races. Normally it's two, Tour de Suisse after the Dauphiné, which has traditionally been used as a tune-up as well, and the Dauphiné, but Tour of Slovenia is now the favourites preparation race. Uh, four or five stage race for Fugaccio. He did it last year. He's doing it again this year. And at Swiss, we have Martinez and I think Vlasov. But here we have most of the Yumbo Visma Tour de France squad Roglic, uh, Laporte, Van Aert, and Jonas. They're the just huge favorites for this race. O'Connor's here, fourth in the tour last year. Haig here, third in the Vuelta. Mas here, second in the Vuelta. Ineos have sent probably their weakest Dauphiné team in a long <laughs> time. Gagenhart, Dunbar, I think they're GC people, but Gagenhart, I mean, maybe comes back. I'm not sure. They're riding for him today. So, yeah, it's really the the Umbo Visma show. Padun's here too. Remember what he did here a, uh, a year ago. But it's not one really for the sprinters, even the quote-unquote sprint stages. Uh, the first stage, La Volta Rhone to Boischatel, 193Ks, and it has a circuit, a big circuit, though, uh, finishing in Boy Chastel, how do you say it? And they do a climb, two climbs put together, the Côte du Chambon du Bavar and the Côte du Moulin Avant. Uh, 5K is 5% short, like 500-meter flat section, and then another 3.5K is 5%. It crests 31.5 kilometers from the finish, which is a flat sprint with a slight left-hand bend with about 50 meters to go. You're a DS, Benji. I am? <laughs> yeah, you're now a DS. You're now a DS. Okay. Is this the climbing sprinty boy stage or is it just a stage for a fit sprinter? I think it depends on how you see it because it depends on which teams are here and which teams are willing to make the race hard and therefore bring more pure sprinters into trouble. And when we look at the teams that require a harder stage to make their sprinter have a chance at winning, this is for me a yumbo, but They've got their focus on GC, so I'm not expecting them to do so before the stage started. And, and it really came down to other teams. What other teams are going to take it on? Which ones are going to make it interesting for their hilly sprinter by trying to drop the likes of Hürnewegen here? And I was perhaps thinking in Ineos, but again, they've got a GC candidate in Gegenhard. Although I feel like they've got the option of actually doing something in that regard. So I was on the edge. It was all dependent on who would take on this stage in a certain way and who would actually use these final climbs especially the final one to try and do damage to the purest sprinters did you have the same feeling yeah because it's it's five k's five percent rest three k's four percent rest uh for 30 kilometers if no a team to create a gap on that has to full send you can't just oh we'll ride tempo on the front the draft effect is huge you won't drop even the Gronovechens of this world who we have here we have barely any pure sprinters we have Van Aert uh, Gronovechen Hater Van Aert and Hater obviously you know get over a hill very very well uh, Steimler Molano Mozzato Walls who did get over these sort of climbs well last year but has struggled this year Bauhaus for Bahrain so sprinters are light on the ground because the parkour of this Dauphiné not that heavy on high mountain stages but also the sprint stages are very difficult as well and um, yeah what happened is exactly what Benji said in that Jumbo Visma were not interested in catching the break they just sent Harper to control it it was a break of three bnb rk uh, uh, and someone else that i'm forgetting intermarche Laurent suisse harper paced interestingly yumbo visma have taken dennis who's going to the tour out of this team sent him to swiss they sent coos to swiss too and i think that makes sense if you want to keep dennis motivated and happy go for the tour de swiss tt stage win go for that instead of riding the front all day in dauphiné you know, which is tiring, and he'll get his work in in the tour. So the big surprise, the big talking point is bike exchange, pacing Benji, controlling the break for Gronovechen, which it didn't make too much sense to me. But I, there is a rationale to it. But what, what was your thought when you first saw it? Well, initially, if you think about it, like if bike exchange has to control it initially to keep the break away, 
in a certain margin to actually have a chance of winning this stage, then they have to do something because perhaps the teams that are trying to ambush a pure sprinters are not going to be the ones that are going to keep it at a certain level with the breakaway. So, and the, and the other teams that want to actually ambush on that final climb can't really afford to control the entire day, I dare to say as well. So I, I was not surprised that they initially started somewhat controlling, but I was surprised that they started properly chasing it and tried to close it down properly like, like most of the work. Because if you do most of the work with a pure sprinter on this parkour, you're going to get attacked in some shape or form. You're going to get a disadvantage towards others. So I would have said the initial control wasn't necessarily the biggest issue, but they kept controlling the end of the entire stage and made sure the break eventually as well got caught. And I think that's too much. Before I say my take on it, I don't think it's actually as bad as it looks at first glance. I mentioned our show partner Zwift. If you're getting into the winter, I believe I've heard it's freezing conditions down in Australia right now. Then Zwift is your perfect online cycling platform to keep on top of your fitness goals. You can go to Zwift.com through the link down below for a free seven-day trial. There's meetups, workouts, pace partners etc to keep you entertained and enthused and we can highly recommend swift for your indoor cycling experience the problem wasn't the pacing if you don't pace for Gronavegan on this stage then why even turn up to the race you the reason a team will keep the break tight is because you don't want it to get really fast to catch the break in the last third of the stage, because if someone else is sending the climb to catch the break, if they're at four minutes, then Gronovegan's in real trouble. You want to keep it tight. So that makes sense. The problem was bringing him. Caden Groves, people might not have seen this. Other teams mentioned this to me. Caden Groves on the Cambrill stage that Carapaz won, the 130K raid, that was hilly. People were like, Caden Groves, what the fuck? He climbed so well in yeah. wet conditions. He won the bunch sprint behind, by the way, third in that stage. He doesn't get dropped today. Now, his program meant he isn't here, it seems, but I think he would have been the perfect rider for Bike Exchange to bring to this race. I think he's out of contract, and I think he's going to get a pretty handsome one. Anyway, they paced. They get to the base of the climb, and here's why I'm not going to call bike exchange clowns too much because what happened is what i didn't expect at all i didn't expect the umber to pace didn't know what any else were going to do in your little black book benji did you have written down pre-stage trek are going to light this climb up for sturvin in a group sprint no 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 i did not have that written down because we've seen a few times in the last years that seven sprint is not exactly on there his sprint in a group sprint a larger group tends to be better sometimes than in a like a four-man group then he actually comes like full for third all the time but he can get a top 10 in a normal sprint but are you going to actually make a race hard like this just to get a potential top 10 with steven if you're trek i i don't see that i don't see that as an option at the start of today's stage and well at the start of that final climb trek started lighting it up and they kind of full send it in the way that you said they should and initially i thought well okay is there a sprinter in that team that I'm not seeing on the start list? But it had to be Steven that they were riding for. And I was kind of shocked that they did. And it immediately had some victims. Sprinters left and right were dropping. But the most notable, pure sprinter in the race, also started having trouble with about 2 to 2.5 kilometers towards the top. We saw him at the back. And with 1.8, 1.9k to the top, he was, uh, he was actually uh, dropping off that group where trek was pacing like mad and what's your take on that i want to hear you first well here's the problem right like it's the first little part of the climb he's dropping so he's not losing 15 to 30 seconds which you can easily salvage in 30 kilometers even on the descent groves is going to make that uh but trek benji yeah like i don't mind ineos you know okay wow's the favorite in the sprint but if ineos don't ride hater gets no chance to sprint and he's at worst going to come probably top three top four that's fine there is such a small chat when did Sturvin like what trek seem to think his sprint is something <laughs> he's Sturvin's an underrated classics rider like he flattered out of roubaix he was good in roubaix his sprint i don't know what they're seeing and the opportunity cost is they don't throw attacks on the climb 
And so it would have been solely Ineos to control because Jumbo wouldn't have really. They use Kreuzweig a little bit. Skerns is used to pace. That's why he doesn't win much. No chance to attack. Kenny used to pace. The whole team used to pace. Tollhook as well. And yeah, they dropped Milano, Bauhaus, Groenewegen. They were back. Bike Exchange dropped their whole team back. They get down the descent. The gap is a minute 30. Uh, Ineos take it up. On, and this makes sense. They've had it served to them on a platter. They're going to pace with Amador and De Plus and Kwiatkowski. And Hayter's going to have a chance to win the stage, even if Wout is the favorite. Yumbo, they eventually got pissed at Yumbo. Gagan Hart, El Patron. Yeah, he's <laughs> El Patron 2.0, said to Yumbo. And fair enough, I think, actually. He said, come on, give us a rider or two, which Yumbo then did. But the gap was down to 55. Bike Exchange have huge engines. Durbridge. Edmondson and co are all pacing against King Kenny on the flat now, and the gap's down to 35 seconds with eight, seven Ks to go, but then it starts to go back up. Total Energy, I don't know who they were. For Bosenhagen, for Bosenhagen, because Van Hestel got dropped, had to remind myself. They start pacing, Yumba start pacing, Ineos start pacing, Trek keep it going for Sturvin, bike exchange done. So, Yeah. I think what Trek did was more perplexing than Bike Exchange today. Honoré had attacked. Quickstep got Steinler here, no real sprinter. But it's not hard enough for Bagioli. They'd attacked on the climb with Honoré, got caught, and then they attacked late with Cavagna. What about Ineos, though, Benji? Do you have to go for Hater on this stage? They have Ganna here. What if Ganna and Kviato go with Honoré on that climb? That puts Yumbo in a very difficult spot. I think it does put Yumbo in a very difficult spot. I don't know how they would have responded. There's multiple options for them. One thing that I do think is that they should have gone for the stage 100%, whether it's for a hater, whether it's within a late attack, a last kilometer attack, for from Ghana, for example, anything like that could have been an option on today's stage. But I don't... Con- well, Gagan's hearts, it, it's difficult to like see him as like a top favorite for the Dauphiné. Let's be honest about it. So... I therefore think they should use every opportunity outside of GC as well to try and take things out of this race. And you're right, a duo attack of Ganna and Kwiatkowski or something on the climb. Ganna launching Kwiatkowski would have been an option, but it's still 30k flat afterwards. So I don't know if Jumbo would have been responsive, but it would have mattered because Trek was the one that was doing a lot of stuff. And we did have a move on the climb, right? Honore went off the front for quick step. Yeah, yeah, he'd gone. Quickstep had tried to be active, and that seemed to be their modus operandi. As we got into the finish, bike exchange pretty much, they they ran out of steam. It goes from 30 to 55 to one minute. Three Ks to go. Haters at the back, and of course, and Kwiatkowski moves him up the left-hand side. You can see Haters just not wanting to... He just doesn't hit those gaps the same way Kwiatkowski will full go into them. And so he waits, gets attached. Kwiatkowski looks behind. He's like, where the fuck are you? Come up here. And he moves him up. No problem. Um, So that was pretty good. And Ineos set up a huge train. They chased down. Cavagna had gone to the front. And then Quickstep let the wheel go. Ineos set up with Kwiatkowski. No, sorry. First Ganna. Huge pull, 60Ks an hour, whilst on Hater's wheel. Whoever the second last man for Trek was or the last man for Sturvin did a magnificent job. Whoever that was, if it was Kirsch, I don't know, he moved Sturvin up from deep whilst Ghana was pacing onto the wheel of Hater, and this was now boxing Wout van Aert. Kwiatkowski goes 300, 250 to go, slight left-hand bend. Hater starts his sprint early. He doesn't mind going early. And goes to the left-hand side, the shortest line. Uh, Wout has to jump early to avoid being boxed by Sturvin. Sturvin didn't jump early for that first bend, and he's now squeezed back behind everybody. Slash, he wasn't quick enough anyway. And Wout goes the long way around, a little bit of elbow action with Hayter keeping Hayter pinned to that barrier a little bit, and Wout wins the stage easily out of Hayter. Biggest Surprise, Sean Quinn of EF Education first, 22-year-old American, who, by the way, did a stagiaire at Quickstep in 2020. He came eighth in Tour de Volony last year whilst on Hagen's and was in the thumbnail of a viral video from UAE Tour that I put up. Um, seems to be quite a nice guy. He came <laughs> third, which, <laughs> what the fuck? Didn't know he's that fast. Hugo Page fourth, quite a good French rider for Intermarche. He's also 20 years old. 20. So nice. Bosenhagen fifth, the opposite end of the age spectrum. Sturvin sixth after all that trek work, and he beat basically climbers, Venturini, Van Hills, Tomar, and Steinler. So, wow, wins. I think Jumbo Benji in the team car got to be 
they got to be laughing. This couldn't have worked out any better. And is this what you think will happen, what they can ride the back of in the tour, where other teams wanting stage wins will lighten their workload for the WOT-style stages? Yes, but they also have the issue that they have such a focus on GC that they kind of need other teams to take control in certain stages, the opposite side to it. Yes, it's great that, for example, Trek to control on the climb today, decided to do that, Bike Exchange controlled the breakaway, Inyaza did some pacing in the last 10 kilometers, for example. Well, that all helped Van Aert because he didn't have to do much and his team didn't have to do much either. I think Jumbo only did one thing where they closed down a late Cavani attack with one of their riders in the end. So all that is not that much in the grand scheme of things, but you got to see the opposite side of the coin. If they end the Tour de France, for example, have Wout, he's not going to have seven riders in his uh, workload. Roglic is not going to work for him. Vingegaard neither. The climbing domestiques neither. So he's going to need other teams to take control to have opportunities in certain stages. Does that make sense? Like, for example, uh, one of those like uphill punchy finishes in in week one that's the Long kind week. of stage i think of yeah well, yeah alperson should for mvdp uh unfortunately binny's not going um quick step you would think would for ala philippe so whereas at the dauphine we're going to see tomorrow well obviously goes into the gc lead but stage two tomorrow is another climbing sprinty boy stage i think more of a climbing sprinty boy stage than today which was more a fit sprinter stage you're still a huge group Stage 270 k's from saint Pere to brive Chanzac. Um, and it's got a fair bit of climbing in it, but they're all shallow gradients. There's a 10k 5% climb. The first 60 k's, uh, brakes should form pretty well and pretty easily descent. And then the Col de Mesillac, 12k's 4%, rolling plateau descent. And then the Cote de Roac, 1200 meters 5%, close to the finish. Uh, and then, yeah, pretty flat-ish finish, I think. Now, we're about to maybe see the answer to the question I just posed tomorrow. Well, it's in yellow. Jumbo Visma got to eat their dinner for free today. <laughs> and Ineos, you know, he beat Hayter pretty comfortably having to go wide. Will we see other teams as willing to put it on a platter for Wout tomorrow? I don't think they should. I, I think Ineos really have to use Ghana Benji to... to to force Jumbo Visma's hand on those climbs. And remember, um, Budget Alaphilippe Burgado, see the guy that won the, mm-hmm. the Paranese oh, stage? Yeah. Remember that Paranese stage? Uh, 1.5K, 6% climb, Trek paced it for Pedersen, and then Pedersen got dropped, kind of similar to today. <laughs> and Jumbo Visma couldn't bring it back for wow. And so I really think the other teams should be putting them under pressure with Trek with Skerns. Kwiatkowski and co. Or do you show faith in your young guy, Benji? Do you go for Hater again? I think there. if it comes down to a sprint, I see it being Hater or Fanat in general, but I've kind of got a feeling that we've got this like larger climb that is that you mentioned with 60k to go, and after that, it's a bit of a plateau section on top, but it's really descending and like small hills in the last like 25, so... Is there an option that the peloton miscalculates the breakaway in that sense? Because this feels like a parkour where the peloton can miscalculate the breakaway. <laughs> well, yeah, Harry Sweeney put up a post on our peloton on Reddit saying which stages suit. I think tomorrow's got to be the one. I think if it's the right breakaway, if Jumbo Visma are disciplined, they they don't chase back breaks for yep. wearing the jersey for an extra day in the Dauphiné. Uh, they're here for Roglic. If it's served up to Wout, they'll take it. So maybe a break wins. Imanol Erviti, a guy you'd look at for this stage, crashed out of neutral today. Unfortunately, the Movistar rider, but yeah, the Sweeney ties. Remember last year in the Dauphiné first stage? Brent van Moer for Lotto Sedal won. Bahrain couldn't control the break. Second stage, similar stage. Uh, Perstelberger won out of a break uh, in a solo move when Bahrain couldn't control. So it's... I think you're right, Benji. I think a break has a really good chance. Who do we like? like I'm trying to look. Pollitt, he looked kind of meh today. I've got a Benjamin Thomas on my list. Ooh, that's... Is he too... No, there's a hard there's a hard mountaintop finish at the end of this, so Tamar, we don't need to worry about. Okay, Tamar, Simon Clark, uh, Bruno Armirail, uh, let me have a look, Venturini, Oliver Narsen. Who else do we have here? Catania, K- 
Cavania. Yeah, when it comes to like quick step, we've got Cavania. We've also got Cherny. He's been in breakaways to get away. Oh, yeah. Who was the other With quick step guy? With Honore, you're right. So an Honore could be as well. Ah, it's there's so many options here, but it really depends on who's in the breakaway. Where we have a decent breakaway that can hold. There's no Magnus Court Nielsen in the breakaway to try and uh, learn, teach everybody during the first hundred kilometers of the stage on how to ride in the breakaway and make sure they have energy left for the final stretch. <laughs> so uh, I guess we'll have to see um, who's in the breakaway, but I'm going to go with Benjamin Tuma. And the thing is, like, his climbing's great as well these days. Yeah, so on, on the climb, it should fast. also be one of the stronger ones. Definitely on the 11K climb, for example. Yeah. So that would that should all fit in. So I'm going to go with the break tomorrow. It could be a sprint. If it's a sprint, then I'm wrong, eh? <laughs> I'm going with Frank Bonamore from the break. Oh, um, yeah. He's been a bit inconsistent this year, but Paranisi was good. Tour de France last year, he was so good in these sort of breaks, but just came up against guns. I uh, like Bonamour for this. Please trek Leschgerns and Bernard and Co in the break. Come on, let it, let him in the break. Uh, but otherwise, the last bit of news we have is Chris Froome. 37 years old. He's in his second year at the unknown length Israel Premier Tech deal. And he did his best ever performance by far, like not even close, whilst wearing an Israel jersey uh, in this week at the Mercantour Classic Alp Maritime on, I think it was Tuesday, and then Apennine was on Thursday, the two 1 1 1 dot pro races to keep us entertained. And you might be thinking, come on, 11th at Mercantour Classic Alp Maritime, it's a 1 1 race. Have a look at the profile. It's like a Tour de France mountain stage in a one-day race. It's a beautiful little race. They do the Colmien, which I think we've seen in Paranese. And he, like Lenny Martinez, did a really hard pace on the climb. Froome seemed to do his own pace. And I think the calculations were that he did like 5.8 watts per kilo for like 35 minutes, which is, from where we've come from, that ain't, that ain't Tour de France winning shape. But that's like, a competent rider again. He looks visibly skinnier. What do you think they should do with him, Benji? Like, do they now say, okay, Tour de France is on? Um, what would you do if you were if you were Israel with him? By the way, they won that race one two with Full Sang Woods, so points are coming thick and fast for them. Yes, yeah, certainly. But when it comes to Froome itself, I um, it's a difficult situation, you know, because on one end you have the exposure that everybody keeps saying that is gigantic. I think the exposure is definitely there. But there needs to be a room on the screen for that exposure to be happening. Exactly. And now he's competent enough to be, well, he's as a rider in the peloton at current form, I mean, not necessarily when it comes to his intelligence. I'm not insulting him here. Now he's in a competent form to be able to show himself in races, I dare to say. And that exposure can come from those performances. And then when we look at American Tour, for example... Yeah, that's 11, but it's still behind the Michel Ries, for example. Yeah, Michel Ries is a young rider that can climb pretty well. But those are not the names that you can say if Froome goes into a Tour de France breakaway. I'm not sure those numbers can make him compete for a nah, stage, for example. Enough. So no. I'm kind of on the edge there. I feel like I haven't looked at Israel's team enough to say these riders need to go, these riders don't need to go. But I'm pretty sure their team will include the likes of uh, a Woods and a Fulsang. And if that is the case, then adding Froome to that as well, what role will he play? Will he just be a domestique? It's possible. Like, I find it very unlikely that they don't send him to the tour, to be honest. I think it's probably worth his reward, to be honest. He's kept grinding. I mean, yes, he's he lost three minutes to Steph Crass on the climb. Like, you ain't coming top five in the tour or top ten in the tour like that, but unless he might completely bomb in the Dauphin. But you have to remember... Last year, he was getting dropped on the climb Gronovec and got dropped on today in the Dauphiné. He got dropped on the climby sprinty boy stages, right? And now he's doing like a competent, good climbing performance. Yep. That's a huge step up. I don't know if he has any more weight to lose. He looks paper thin and Benji's right. To win Tour de France stage for, in a mountain stage, you need – from the break, <laughs> like Danny Martinez Primary, I remember Kemner being like, saying in the interview, it's like, I was just sitting on his wheel, like, what the fuck? And like Martinez now, Ineos, maybe best GC leader. And that was to win a primary from the break, 
Vuelta's different. Froome, at that shape, good enough to win a Vuelta stage. And Joel Madrazo beat Jose Herrada in a Vuelta stage uphill. Like, it's possible from the right break. Uh, but it's really good to see. Like, I don't think... You know, I've said before, he's not going back to that level. Even if peak Froome, by the way, even if Froome was peak Sky Froome, he still couldn't win the tour on Israel. The equipment, everything, it, it's yeah. not possible. So, uh, but it's good to see. And I, I go to bed every day, every day I go to bed and I pray as a rights holder, please can Chris, Chris Froome do stuff and be good because it's good <laughs> for the sport. It's like he's a huge name. Same with Sagan. Uh, but yeah, any last thoughts on Froome? Do you think. Yeah, where do you think he goes on this Dauphiné mountain stage? It's a really hard mountain stage. Do you reckon he top 15, 20? Oh, like he – the thing with Froome as well in the history is that he was never that great outside of his like main goals of the season. Yes, he had moments where he was good at a Tirreno, for example, but some of his preparation races were not that extreme. And then we look at this Dauphiné, I'm like, on paper, I'm, I'm expecting a similar performance to Merkel on tour then, unless he like – expanded his skills since then once again but if he improved once again in form i i'm not sure if i can say top 15 top 20 it depends on what role he does because like do you think he's actually going to go for gc himself here at this race his team doesn't have any other gc rider he can try i guess and if that's the 100%. case then top 25 100%. i'm i i don't dare to say much more at the moment there but i hope that he does well just because like it's not fun to see someone try so much when it comes to coming back from an injury and not really succeeding in that sense. So I'd love to see Froome do something pretty strong at some point. Yeah, and as I said at the start of this segment, best performance in an Israel jersey. He was doing better performances in an Ineos jersey post-crash at either Rutoxitani. He did he like reduced the group to like ten guys on him in a mountain stage, crazy performance post-crash, but it was barely televised. I don't think there was just iPhone footage of it. Uh, But yeah, that climber referred to 11.5 case, 9%. You can't hide there. The watts per kilo will out. So we'll see there. Uh, But yeah, hopefully hopefully top 15, top 20, pretty good. Maybe Padun wins. Uh, Who knows? (laughs) But that's all from us at the Dauphiné. Uh, Otherwise, there's uh, the Adriatico. Adriatica Ionica race going on. Not a great start list. There's been some uh we should make note of Arno Dali just quickly. The kid is ridiculously good, this youngster on Lotto Sedal. Next Bonin, but I think he's Valoon. Um he won another race. He just keeps adding 125 points once a week to Lotto's tally, and he beat Nitzolo on Cavendish. So I think Lotto Benji is staying up. I think I know Lee is single-handedly pulling them out of the relegation zone, and yeah. it's lovely to see because I love it when youngsters are the ones that can put the world upside down and do stuff that was not expected. I know Lee was a rider we expected a lot from at the start of the season, but we did not feel like not he this. should be the sole responsible <laughs> person for carrying Lotto outside of this, and this was indeed way more than we would have expected from him. I expected perhaps like, uh, a stage win to break through or something somewhere and he did that very early and then he kept on doing it and now it's again solid composition as well Cavendish Nizzolo in that Helen Voskut has Sapel and yeah like the famous the famous race <laughs> yeah yeah the fa- the famous Belgian classic oh These one of the best races man <laughs> get out of here this is one close to my home <laughs> they're all close to your home <laughs> There's a hundred close to your home. What do you mean? <laughs> no, you're okay. right. It's like whatever this race is, or local farmers carnival doesn't matter. He beat Cavanish and his solo last. Like, and he followed, I think, Piet Allegard on the climb, and we're talking about it. But yeah, I thought he'd get a thousand points. I think he's on twelve hundred now. He'll probably get like eighteen hundred, two thousand. Ridiculous. Um, and yeah, EF if they don't turn it around quickly are in real trouble because Israel are coming too. They've just all done altitude, full sang woods looking better. They had the worst start of the year possible. Their solo crash in MSR now looking good. EF and Bike Exchange got to be concerned uh, from that regard. But that's all from us today. Hope you enjoyed it. Dauphiné Stage 2 recap tomorrow, and then we'll, yeah, we'll see you with that. Thanks to Swift. Ciao.